As a southern bumpkin who had grown up in the deep woods, well, more specifically, the bumfuck middle of nowhere Alabama woods, I always get taken back to a very interesting chapter in my life. You see, as a kid, I had always marveled at how constant yet inconsistent the forest was. The ground always had critters frantically scurrying around the seemingly still leaves. The river kept a constant flow sourced from the loud and chaotic falls we had some miles away. The trees would sway side to side during the stormy season yet stay rooted firmly on the ground. Their leaves would turn all sorts of colors only to disappear completely in the dead of winter. Yep, nothing was safe from change. Come to think of it, strange as it was, even the mannequins changed out there. Now folks, if you think that sentence seemed out of place in my story, imagine how it was for me seeing them for the first time. I remember first spotting them when I was around 6 years old. I barely reached up to my father's knees, but I had finally learned how to stop tripping over my own two left feet and Pa felt it was safe enough to let me take a hike with him for the first time. As a girl, the wilderness fascinated and scared me, but I had never once assumed that I would find mannequins in the forest. I could be out there with Pa looking for frogs or trying to find some kindling for our fireplace. And then surprise! A random mannequin not too far from the house would be there waiting for us. I use the term mannequins freely, but originally they were more like bodices. Kinda like the ones that Ma used to use to drape fabric over whenever she would make some new clothes. Damn kids and their pranks. Scowling, Pa would grip the strap attached to his rifle and scooted me along in the opposite direction from where we had come from. Pay them no mind, Kit. He'd say, Pappy's got a gun. I remember taking my pa's hand and dwelling on that comment until we got home. I thought it was pretty silly that he wanted to shoot something found in mama's old sewing room. Why didn't he just put them somewhere else? Or at least kick them down. They weren't menacing, but they sure did startle me sometimes. They always seemed to be everywhere in the woods, almost as if they were following us. Then again, thinking about it some more, it wasn't really a surprise. Lord knows I loved him, but my pa was a really irresponsible guy. Being the only child mama could give him before her death, God rest her soul. He was determined to raise me right. He wanted me to be a gun toting rough and tumble country kid who could hurt as well as pick a fight and win it. Admittedly, I had formed some complex because of it, always wondering if just maybe, Papa would have been better off with a boy. Let's just say, I was desperate to gain his approval. At the ripe old age of seven, he put a firearm in my hands. You see this cricket? This is a Ruger. You see this cricket? This is a Ruger. He'd beam. Back then, that rifle felt too heavy for my string bean arms to hold. I could barely keep it on my lap. This rifle's been in our family for a long time. Kept a lot of us safe and fed. I'm going to teach you how to hunt with it. Deer season is where we'll start. I furrowed my brow and looked around the cabin and rested my eyes on the mountain buck head above the fireplace. I don't think I can do it, Pa. Sweet little deer. They ain't little, Pa retorted. And they ain't sweet. You gotta learn how to defend yourself out there. Deer come in all shapes and sizes. I realized then that it was useless to protest. Pa had made up his mind, and even at seven, I knew he was a stubborn man. There was no win in this battle, so, at the time, I just nodded my head and sadly agreed. Eventually, when I turned 12, Pa deemed me ready, mostly because as a stocky kid, I could hold on to that rifle. The excitement in my belly bubbling up as he led me out back and stood me in front of the shed made me giddy. He had never, he had never allowed me in there. When he flung open those doors, my eyes went big as saucer plates. A deer? Right in the garage? It was still doe-eyed and staring right back at me. I walked up to him and Pa stopped me. Hold your horses, Cricket. It's not real. Pa said. It's a decoy. Although it's a bit different from those you see in the store. He, he walked up to the deer. Those are plastic. Fake as they come. He slapped a hand along his back. This one here is stuffed with cotton. We call it taxidermy, he beamed. I'd like to think that deer are a little smarter than we give them credit for. I know that most of them can spot those fake things a mile away. This here doe, well it's never failed me before. And we're going to use it as bait for when we go hunting. We're going to teach you to shoot. As soon as he said that, a familiar feeling of dread washed over me. I didn't want to kill anything, but I wasn't about to make Pa upset. The hunting grounds were beautiful. Pa found a bush to hide behind and a great clearing that he mentioned was known for buck sightings. Just let me get this set up, he said. He set the fake doe on a sunny area of the clearing. Gotta make sure the doe doesn't fall over if the buck, uh, hugs him. 
I rolled my eyes. He got out some ground anchors and rope and started wooing her firmly to the spot. After scattering some leaves to hide the materials, Dad smiled. Perfect. He looked back at me. Let's get to hunting. The first day of hunting was uneventful. The first round of bucks had mistakenly, or rather correctly, assumed that the doe was a threat and went back. Correctly assumed that the doe was a threat and went for the attack, which wouldn't have been a problem had my hands not been so shaky. I couldn't exactly hit a moving target, much less an aggressive-looking one. Every time I'd reluctantly put the gun down, Pa would say, "It's okay. We'll get him next time." As the sun went down, every missed kill left me feeling disappointed. Pa was determined, though. No matter how tired he looked. He would repeat the same thing. It's okay. We'll get him next time. Followed by a condescending pat on the back. Failed shot after failed shot and shell after shell. There Pa would be, reassuring me that we'd definitely get him next time. These ritualistic embarrassments would keep going on for about three weeks. Some days we'd have to start all over and move to a new spot because a mannequin would appear in our perfect clearing. Those were, those were the worst. Pa would get angry and we'd have to lug that doe further away from where we parked. All because of those stupid, then department-looking mannequins. By the end of it all, what with the constant runaround and the failed hunting trips, I'd only managed to scare away several animals and graze too many trees. I had just about had it. On the last day of the third week, I remember walking back to the car, hanging my head and kicking the dirt beneath my feet. Pa patted my back. It's okay. We'll get him next time. I could feel the blood boiling in my skin. I'm tired of this, Pa. I said. I'm just not a hunter. Pa sighed. Not yet, but you will be. We'll get him next time. Stop saying that. No, we won't. I screamed. We won't ever get him because I can't use a thing to save my life. I held the Ruger in front of me. My father's eyes scanned mine, his face stone cold. Put that back on. Don't ever take it off out here. Do you understand? And don't you keep saying that you won't kill. You have to learn how to protect yourself. I'm freaking 12 and you're forcing me to shoot animals so I can learn how to use this thing. I gripped the weapon hard. Guess what? I don't want it. I threw the gun towards my father. My hand not expecting it fell to angle himself, and the steel ended up clocking him square on the nose. God damn it! Blood started to trickle down from his nose where the gun had landed. It wasn't long before the yellow leaves at his feet started to turn a crimson red. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it, Pa. The pain I felt growing on my cheek after my dad slapped me wasn't as bad as the shame I felt from him saying, Kit, it's time you grow the fuck up. It's an eat or be eaten world out there. He shoved the gun into my hands. He shoved the guns onto my hands. I looked up at him. Just because you couldn't stop mom from dying doesn't mean I have to pay for it. You know if your mama saw you now, I know she'd be real let down. He snapped. With that remark being enough, I ran for the woods. Anywhere away from him, I ran and ran, ignoring my dad's cries for me to come back. I don't know if my dad wanted to give me space or if I managed to lose him. I don't even know if he was... I don't even know if he followed me. I certainly couldn't hear him chasing me through my running. I collapsed onto the dirt, wondering if he would leave me out there. Wondering if maybe I deserved it. I wiped my tear-stained cheek and sprawled out on the ground, looking up at the sky. I was sure Mama was let down by me, which only made me cry some more for a good while. After about ten minutes of self-pity, I got that familiar sense of nausea most kids get after not eating and running about half a mile through the forest. I rubbed my belly. We hadn't eaten since this morning. I closed my eyes, thinking back. If I remember correctly, I think we passed a berry bush on the way to the hunting grounds. That's a mulberry bush, Kit, Dad had told me. If you ever get hungry, it's safe to enjoy them for a little snack. Just wash them first. I looked around. The bush couldn't have been that far from where I was. Unfortunately, 15 minutes later of endless wandering and searching had me realize I was completely and utterly lost. Where was my dad? Had he really left me there? I started to pick up my pace through the woods. I glanced down at my watch, 5 p.m. It was starting to get dark. I tried brushing away my fear by focusing on something else. I started looking at the clouds as I walked. Hopefully I would make my way out of the thick wilderness and onto the campsite. Hopefully there would be people out there. Hopefully there would be food. Was Daddy looking for me? He must be worried. I should apologize when I find him. I strained my eyes ahead of me, searching for a clearing. I gasped when I saw him. Out ahead, about 40 feet away from me, was a person. I ran towards them, waving my arms and screaming in the loudest voice I could muster. Please wait! Please! Desperately trying to get their attention. Thankfully, they seemed to be preoccupied with whatever they were looking at. When I was close enough, I struggled to catch my breath, gasping for air, and stumbled onto the ground. I'm... I'm glad I caught you, I gasped as I struggled to catch my breath. But looking up to my dismay, was yet another mannequin. I felt my cheeks growing hot. 
I slammed my hands on the ground in frustration. Of course it was. It always is. I rolled my eyes and threw down the gun in disgust. How could I, mis how could I mistake a mannequin for a person? I lifted my head. The realization kicked in. I mistook a mannequin for a person? I had never done that before. I looked at it again. This was a really convincing one. They had never looked this real before. I tilted my head and observed it a little more closely. He was standing in some kind of awkward mid-motion gesture, with his right hand raised up as if to say hello, beaming this toothy, half-open smile. Honestly, this one had been the best one yet. The hair was so realistic. Not like that horse hair you see some wigs made out of. It looked so fine and wispy. The teeth were naturally crooked and had a slightly yellow tinge to them. The gum showed a glossy sheen. There were cracks on its lips and its tongue. Every pore on its face was visible. It even had a little veins on the side of its nose. I examined his body. Strangely enough though, the clothes he wore looked more like he was ready to go to some highfalutin restaurant than roughing it in the woods. He looked like some kind of caricature. I laughed at the uncanniness of it all. Ironic that the fakest thing about the mannequin was his outfit. Well, that, and it also hadn't moved the entire time I stared at it. But still, it looks so... human. What the heck is this? I stepped closer, slightly freaked out, and slightly wanting to get a feel of it. It couldn't be real. No way. I wasn't five feet away from the thing before I felt something tug me back. I turned around to see Pa's angry face. What did I tell you about not having your gun on you? I felt the tears well up in my eyes. Pa pointed to the muscles as he held his gun. Put them on! Put them on! Alarmed, I raised my muscles to my ears. BAM! Daddy fired five shots into seemingly nowhere deep in the forest, the last one blasting the mannequin. What are you doing? I cried. He grabbed my hands with a panic I'd never seen in him before, threw both of our muscles on the ground as we ran. I swiveled my head back to the mannequin. It miraculously hadn't fallen over from the blast. The half-open smile now gone as his jaw had been blown clean off. Pieces of flesh were hanging on below his nose. It didn't look like a mannequin anymore. I could see white stuff was scattered all over the leaves at his feet. I saw more falling out of the hole from its upper jaw. It took 12 minutes of non-stop running before Pa and I made it out of the woods and back into the truck. The entire time I saw Pa frantically looking back through our surroundings. He could barely get the key in the lock with how bad his hands were shaken. After he tossed me in the truck, he got in, slammed the door shut, started the engine and pressed on the pedal with a frantic desperation. Driving out of the forest and swerving around the mountains at a speed that terrified me. Pa, please slow down, you're gonna kill us! I screamed. Pa looked at me for a second. Didn't you hear it? The look on Pa's frantic wild eyes chilled me to the core. I'll never forget them. I sat there and tried to remember what I had at the time, thought it was just my imagination as we ran away. Maybe my muffs hadn't been on right when Pa fired his guns, and my ears had played tricks on me. But after Pa had ripped off our muffs, when we were running away, I could have sworn that I heard someone saying something deep in the bushes. Don't worry. We'll get him next time.